Hi everyone, welcome back to the Commodore Room. Hope everyone is doing well. It's been a little while since my last video. I've got a lot of projects in flight, probably too many, and I haven't really had time to finish any of them to the point where I'm happy showing them on video. So what I'm going to do today though is I'm going to tell you a little bit about this 15412 disk drive. This is uh, tore apart, some wires are cut, I'm, I'm working on a couple modifications here that you'll see soon in an upcoming video. But what I wanted to talk about today is a slight modification to this that some of you may find interesting or, or helpful. So I was talking to a friend of mine the other day who had, ta who had mentioned that he has a lot of really cool devices now with the, you know, the, uh, the SD card based disk drives, the Raspberry Pi, you know, the, the 1541 Pi project, uh, hard drives. There's a lot of Commodore devices out there nowadays. And as you'll recall, or as you may be aware, the 1541 series of disk drives came by default with device number 8 set. The 15412 is a little bit nicer on the back of the drive. You've got a couple small switches that you can flip that will give you device 8, 9, 10, or 11 depending on the combination of those two switches. Now the 1571 and I believe the 1581 even did the same thing. That's all fine and dandy but a lot of folks today have more than those four devices. So what could we do with this to give us more device number options or perhaps change this so that it starts at a higher number. So rather than starting at 8 and then having 9, 10, and 11 as being options with the switches, what if we started at 12 and then we could flip the switches to get up to 13, 14, 15. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to make a slight modification, a really quick easy modification actually to this disk drive to allow it to start at device number 12 and with the switches go all the way up to 15. So hopefully somebody finds this interesting, but I thought it was kind of a fun challenge, something I've never done before, and to be honest, I never thought of, so that's what we're going to do. So what we have here is the schematic for the 1541-2 disk drive. You'll see it's got a 6502 and a couple 6522s. The 6502, of course, is the CPU, and the 6522s are uh, basically I.O. chips. They're known as Versatile Interface Adapters or VIA chips. And you'll notice here there are two switches connected to this VIA. So let's zoom in. You'll see the two switches here. I'll go ahead and circle them. These are the switches on the back of the 15412 that control the device number. They're, inter they're uh, connected directly to the uh, VIA chip which of course the uh, 6502 can read. So what's happening here is when the device is powered on, it is reading the position of these switches and then storing that someplace in RAM. Uh, I know that because while the device is running, I did some testing and flipped the switches and nothing changed. So the device obviously is reading the position of the switch and storing it someplace in RAM. Otherwise, when I was flipping those switches, it would behave differently. Or put another way, when you turn the drive on, where however those switches are set is the device ID it has. And subsequent flips of the switches don't do anything. So um, what we need to do is kind of figure out how the uh, ROM is reading the position of these switches, where it's storing it, and what do we need to do to modify that. So I thought it might be useful now to go into a, just a little bit more detail on how the 6502 is talking to that VIA chip. The 6502 basically just reads memory. You can think of the memory space or the amount of memory that it has as just one big long street with a little house at each address that can store one byte of data. And recall one byte is eight bits, eight, one, or zeros. And so all the 6502 really knows is memory. It talks to memory and it uh, you know, reads and writes as it needs to. Anytime the 6502 needs to talk to a particular house or particular address, it puts that address on what's called the address bus. The address bus is essentially 16 wires that it puts a 1 or a 0 or a 0 or 5 volts out on. And that, along with some other logic, um, lights up or turns on one of these houses to put its data on what's called the data bus. And the data bus then is read by the 6502. Uh, so the 6502 can read and write to the data bus. In some cases it's going to read from memory, in other cases it's going to write to memory just like you would expect. Now the interesting thing here 
is that you know these different houses or these different addresses could be RAM, they could be ROM, or they could be just a device itself, in this case, the VIA chip. That's what you would call a memory mapped device. Not all devices work that way. Uh, the Commodore 128 does some interesting things to kind of work around the limitation because as you can see here, there's only so many houses. And it turns out this is about 64,000 houses, 65,536 to be exact, but there's a limited number of houses. And so uh, memory map devices take up a, a certain space in that, uh, in that range. So in the case of the uh, VIA that we're talking about, it actually takes eight bytes, or I'm sorry, 16 bytes, as you can see here, from 1800 hex to 180F hex. So there's 16 little houses. And specifically, the switches are tied to port B on the first 6522 VIA chip, the one that we were looking at in the schematic. And then uh, specifically, it's bits five and six. So when the 6502 puts this address, 1800 onto the address bus. It's able to talk to that chip right there and obviously you can't really write to those switches but you can certainly read from those switches. Writing to them uh, is something that it could do but it's not going to have any outcome. Um, certainly electrically possible to, to put something on that but it's not going to do anything. So um, reading bits 5 and 6 of that address will tell us the position of the switches. So when the 6502 is powered up, it's pulling that in, storing it off in RAM someplace, and then working off of that RAM copy. And you may recall that you can send a command to your disk drive, and it will change the device number to whatever you've specified in that command, uh, which obviously is another hint that it's storing it in RAM someplace. So you might be wanting to know, how did I know that that VIA chip was at 1800, address 1800. And so here's how. Uh, this is the 1541 memory map. And the memory map basically describes how that memory space is laid out. What is at each address? Uh, in some cases, what's it, what is it used for? And as you can see here in this case, down here at 18OC, it's not used at all. So that little house, if you will, is just not used. So if we were going to make some modifications, um, we could store something there and probably not cause any problems, assuming our map is accurate. So uh, looking at 1800 and just searching through this uh, memory map, you can see here device number set with jumper. And it talks a little bit about what it's doing there. So um, this is not a jumper, obviously, on this particular model of the disk drive. It actually has switches, but some of them had jumpers. Um, added on and, and solder traces and stuff on some of the older models but this is it this is how you can tell where in the memory map you need to look and so what we're going to do next is look at a rom disassembly and which is essentially reverse reverse engineering that rom chip to see exactly what's going on with this 1800 uh, port what's reading it what's going on and then we'll figure out how to adjust the default what we're looking at here is the 1541 ROM disassembly. Because I have nothing better to do, um, I am actually recognize this. This disassembly is, has come from the Abacus book, uh, Anatomy of the 1541. And so it's pretty familiar. I've looked at this before. There, uh, as you can see here, there's a reset routine, which is pretty easy to find just by searching through the file for something like power on or reset. Uh, as you're looking through, you will notice something here that is test ROM and ROM error. So what's happening here is the uh, power on routine or the reset routine is uh, calculating a checksum on the ROM and verifying that everything is, is okay. Now, once I make some changes to this to change the default device number, this checksum is no longer going to pass and we're going to get an error. So we have two choices, recalculate the checksum, replace it with the new one which would be the clean, elegant way of doing it. Uh, the more kludgy, hacky way of doing it would be to just turn off the ROM test and just skip it. Um, because I'm lazy and that's the easy one I can do in my head, we're just going to turn it off. So essentially what we're going to do is these two addresses right here, or these two instructions right here, are the two that are testing. As you can see, there's compare instructions. Uh, I'm going to replace this with uh, no operation. So I'm going to change these two bytes right here to EAs which uh, is the code for no-op. 
and then I'm going to replace these two with EA. So effectively, when the uh, routine comes through, it's going to do a little bit of work, and it's not even going to bother testing it and just move on. It'll go ahead and test the RAM, as you can see here, which is good. Uh, but then when we get down here, what you can see is this is where it's reading, actually right here, where it's reading the uh, port from that VIA chip and then pulling off the position of those switches. Right here is the key. Um, this 8 is the default device number. So what I'm going to do is change that. And instead of using 8, I'm going to use 12. So I'm going to change this 48 to 4C. So I'm going to bring up a hex editor, very quickly go in, make the changes with those uh, four EAs or those four bytes I'm changing up up top and then this byte here. So essentially I am changing five bytes in this file to disable the ROM test and then give us a default device number of 12. Okay, what you see here on the screen is the Commodore 15412 ROM image. What we're going to do is we're going to find these byte patterns from the ROM, ROM disassembly in the image and then make those changes that we talked about just a minute ago. So first and foremost, we're going to change these, the, this, this line here along with the, the line two down, this one here. And we're going to make those four bytes, the DO39 and the D0DF, into EAs. The important thing to keep in mind is this address you see on the left here, this is the address of that ROM in the memory space of the uh, 6502, which you will recall is 64K. The ROM itself is only 16K, so the address within the ROM, or the uh, position offset, is not going to match, so you're not going to be able to find it in the same place. So you could calculate the offsets, and then of course you could go straight to it, or you could take the lazy way, which is what I'm going to do, and I'm just going to look for a byte pattern and um, fast forward to that. So in this case, what I'm going to look for is this uh, TAX instruction, transfer A to uh, accumulator to X, along with these two guys, knowing that these byte patterns can appear more than once in a ROM image. So I'll do a little bit of spot checking just to make sure I'm in the right spot, and then we'll go from there. So uh, before that, you'll see the 6900, which it is. So I think this is the right spot. So we're, what we're going to do is we're going to change the, the do 39 and the do DF, all four of those bytes, to EAs. So there's our do 39 and then our do DF. This should disable our ROM check. Next thing we want to do is we want to come down here and we're looking for this right here, the 48. So we're going to look for three 2As in a row, which should be really close to the bytes that we just changed. And you'll see they are. And we are wanting this 48. So what we're going to do is we're going to change that 48 to a 4C. And that's it. So the, the five bytes you see in red are the five bytes that we changed. We save this file burn it to an EEPROM, and we should have a 15412 that has a default device number of 12. So now that we have our ROM file ready, the only thing left to do is to burn that ROM file to an EEPROM. So we'll go ahead and load it up. We've got Mini Pro fired up here. We'll go ahead and program the device, which should only take a few seconds as you can see here. Okay, everything looks good. And I always like to double verify just for kicks. Okay, everything looks good. We will put this ROM into the disk drive and see if it works. Okay, so here's our EEPROM right here that we just burnt. I will go ahead and put a little piece of tape over the window just to make sure everything is good there. And the last step, we'll put the EEPROM in this disk drive it's uh, got a few things going on here, so hopefully we'll see this drive in a future video with some other kind of neat modifications. Okay, ROM is in. Let's go ahead and just power it up. So everything powered up nice and neat. Now we will see if it works. Okay, so I've got the switches set for device 15. So just to verify that 8 doesn't work, 
We'll go ahead and pull the directory off of device 15, and you can see that it found it. We'll go ahead and list the directory, and there we go. So that's very nice. What we'll do now is we'll go ahead and save that directory just to a test file, just to make sure we can write to it, which we should be able to based on our ROM disassembly. And it is working here. And we'll go ahead and do one more final directory just to see that we see our test file. And there it is. Success. So there we go. We've modified this disk drive to allow us to start at device number 12 and then with the switches at the back get to 13, 14, and 15 without the hassle of sending software commands and whatnot. This should allow us to use this disk drive with a bunch of the other modern peripherals that we talked about earlier without any trouble at all. I hope you've enjoyed this little modification here. If there's any questions, feel free to let me know. If you like this sort of technical content, feel free to subscribe. And I hope you'll come hang out in the Commodore room again with us real soon.